Back in 2017, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds would release an early access and mark the beginning of the explosion in popularity of the modern day battle royale genre. In the months and years following PUBG's surprising breakout success, many games would try to capitalize on the popularity rush of battle royale games, and while a few would manage to establish a chunk of the market share for this genre, many developers and games tried and then failed to grab and keep player attention. Nowadays, when it comes to successful battle Battle Royales, there's kind of the big four. PUBG, Fortnite, Apex Legends, and Call of Duty Warzone. Those make up majority of the market share, and then there's a handful of smaller games that have managed to survive based on being niche enough and having a tight-knit community supporting the game and keeping it alive. There's a handful of Battle Royale-inspired games that aren't quite the traditional Battle Royale game. And then there's all of the rest of the games that tried and are now mostly forgotten about. Yeah, we put a Battle Royale in Fallout 76. Yeah, this was a really weird time. This is 2019 E3, and Fallout 76 is like coming off of the heels of probably one of the most disliked Fallout releases that Bethesda has ever put out. At launch, Fallout 76 was in a really bad state. The game was criticized for having this barren world where there weren't NPCs to interact with. The game was very bare bones and janky, and just the jump to live to service didn't translate as well as fans had hoped Fallout 76 would be. So at the next E3, after the game's release, it was Bethesda's turn to show that they had heard the fan feedback and they were pivoting the game to make it better. The presentation wasn't a complete disaster. They did announce a lot of big, meaningful changes that would mark a turning point for Fallout 76. Fallout 76 had its own myriad of problems already. An announcement for a battle royale was weird. But okay, they're doing a VR mode called Nuclear Winter Mode, and there would be a free trial for Fallout 76 around the same time that did kind of soften some of the blowback. But what did this Fallout battle royale mode really play like. Before we get into this though, this video is sponsored by Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a free to join monthly club that sends you a box of awesome filled with high quality unique items. 90% of their products come from small brands, many which are based right here in the US. For example, the American barbecue rub in the carnivore box is made by the great American spice company in Rockford, Michigan. Bespoke Post is pretty awesome. When you sign up, there's a short quiz you can take so that they can know exactly what you're interested in for all current and future products. Every box of awesome has around a $70 value, but will only cost you a fraction of that. And even better, you're able to preview your box of awesome before it's shipped, so you can decide if you want to swap it out for a different box or just skip the month for no charge. So essentially, you never have to worry about paying for things that you don't want. They actually hooked us up with some of their boxes a few months ago, and anything that they've ever sent us has always been super high quality, like this Weekender bag from the Weekender box. It's really useful for short travel or visiting family, and can fit all types of things you might need for a weekend away. More recently, they also sent us this bean box, which comes with a heavy duty headlamp that has a maximum of 600 lumens and can cast up to 120 hours in a single charge. Luke has actually been using this for a few weeks now to walk his dogs in the evening, which is really useful for people like us who stay awake during Pika Gamer hours. These are just a few examples, and there are so many more boxes for any kind of interest, basically. And if it sounds interesting to you, you get 20% off your first box of awesome if you use our link in the description and enter Rocketsloth20 at checkout. Let's go ahead and get back to the video. Okay, so this battle royale mode worked in a map called Appalachia, which was essentially a modified version version of the game's main map, designed specifically for a tighter and more competitive experience. It would match players with up to 52 total players, and teams were able to be formed with up to four players. Then in traditional Battle Royale style, there'd be a ring with fire that would close in. It'd be like a nuclear storm, and I guess that ties into the name of the nuclear winner and the whole Fallout universe thing. Then you would start out with minimal loot, and you'd have to scavenge for better guns, just like a stereotypical Battle Royale. Now, interestingly enough, this was one of the first Battle Royale games to include PvE as a part of the game. Like, there would be creatures from the Fallout universe appearing that would add an additional challenge, but you had to be careful because you didn't want to overcumber yourself, and then, you know, how the whole Fallout thing is when you have your pockets too full of loot. And they had this whole mechanic where you're able to equip perks beforehand with different effects, which would make you better at, like, healing, or you'd have better weapon accuracy and stuff like that. But then, to make things better or worse, players had the ability to launch a nuke in the game. You had to go and find four nuclear codes and a launch briefcase in a single game, and the games ran about 15 minutes long or so. And with that, you'd be able to nuke a small portion of the map. That could potentially give you a competitive advantage, though the nukes weren't like this instant victory type thing like you would expect from a game like Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 back in the day when you got those nukes. The blast area was kind of 
kind of small. Now, when this game was announced and released, the fan reception was mostly skeptical, I would say. Honestly, nobody expected this to happen, and it kind of came out of nowhere. And then, upon playing the game, it was an okay experience, but was it better or unique enough compared to games like PUBG, Apex, or Fortnite? Not at all. Just under two years after the launch of the Battle Royale mode in June 2021, Bethesda announced that Nuclear Winter would be shut down, and a few months later, it was gone for good. Essentially, Bethesda acknowledged that Nuclear Winter had not achieved a large player base and that the mode's popularity was slowly slipping away. Also, they finally noted that the players who did still play Fallout 76 were more interested in other aspects of Fallout 76, not this weird game mode that was kind of phoned in. So, of course, Bethesda claimed that removing this feature would allow more resources to open up for them to work on other parts of the game, probably more important parts of the game. I mean, the Battle Royale was fine, and I'm sure a lot of people had fun with it, but up until this point, other than Elder Scrolls Online, I guess, Bethesda's main franchises were always known for single-player experiences, and this random step into a more multiplayer experience with a bad cooperative online mode with Fallout 76 at launch, and then this weird BR mode? It was a weird call nonetheless. They weren't the only ones just randomly trying to add a Battle Royale mode into their established universe to try to get a slice of the gamer pie with the Battle Royale mode. Let's talk about Call of Duty Black Ops 4. Man, it must have been really challenging to be a developer at Treyarch during the development of Call of Duty Black Ops 4. That interest in a Battle Royale mode just kind of came out of nowhere, and Activision knew that they wanted Call of Duty to capitalize on the success of Battle Royales in one way or another. They needed something ASAP. So despite the fact that Black Ops 4 was already well underway in development, Activision stepped in and wanted to turn the ship hardcore to make sure that the game could launch with a Battle Royale mode. That meant the entire campaign that was planned for Black Ops 4 and already well into development would get cut and cancelled in favor of having the developers working on the campaign side of things to reallocate their focuses to getting a Battle Royale mode ready for launch. And honestly, all things considered, and with all of the games we're going to talk about in this video, Blackout wasn't all that terrible. Of course, nowadays, looking at Blackout compared to more modern Battle Royale games, yeah, it definitely was built in a short amount of time and did not have a lot of regular content updates and features that would keep player interest alive. But the first couple of months of Blackout were actually a pretty good experience. You see, during 2018, there still was a demand for a more realistic Battle Royale game that was different from games like Apex and Fortnite. PUBG was kind of the closest experience you had, but the fact that that game kind of was known for having all over the place performance issues in the earlier years, and maybe still sometimes nowadays, and the game primarily being a third person game with some mixes of first person in between with some combat, essentially meant that there was still room for a different type of Battle Royale game to become really popular. And I think Blackout did a lot for showing how the formula could work in a Call of Duty setting, and I think that was the biggest takeaway that Blackout contributed. Also, it was really cool that they built a unique map that took locations from popular Black Ops games in the past, even one from Call of Duty World at War, which was cool, and gave a pretty straightforward experience where players would run around and find weapons and attachments. There were vehicles, and you wanted to position yourself in the best spot in the circle. However, I don't think that Activision ever planned on Blackout to maybe be the de facto game as a service for their Battle Royale moving forward. If anything, maybe they were just trying to establish their market share before they could have a real Battle Royale experience developed and built out for the masses. Blackout lacked a lot of very important features that would have maybe established Blackout as like a longer term experience. First of all, the game was paywalled, so you had to buy Call of Duty Black Ops 4 first before you would have access to the Battle Royale game, which already was a pretty steep entry level compared to games like Apex and Fortnite that were free. And while crossplay wasn't as commonplace back in 2018, the lack of crossplay definitely didn't help in the later years of Blackout's life, as finding a game in some platforms could be harder than in other platforms. And then lastly, the updates for Blackout were really slow, and when they did finally release some sort of content update, it was kind of a minuscule change to the regular gameplay experience. They did eventually add a new map to Blackout, Alcatraz, which was a cool addition, but by the time that this actually released, 
Interest in Call of Duty Black Ops 4 was already fading fast. The game itself just wasn't built to support the demand of updates that Battle Royale games typically need to have in a rather frequent manner. Fortunately though, Blackout laid out some great groundwork and a lot of these issues would be addressed when Call of Duty would release its follow-up Battle Royale experience as a free-to-play game in March of 2020 with Call of Duty Warzone. And of course, nowadays, you at least can still play Blackout if you're patient enough and you jump on and try to find a lobby. So if you're feeling nostalgic, you can still go back and play the game so it's not fully dead, but you definitely understand what we mean when we're talking about dead Battle Royale games. I don't even remember the last time there was a content update to Blackout and it doesn't look like there's any plans to continue to make new content for Blackout moving forward. It's essentially a dead game. So Blackout was, at least for a little while, a success. It set the groundwork up for the future, but one game that tried to jump in also that definitely did not set anything up for the future and just flopped hard, Battlefield 5 and its Battle Royale mode. Now interestingly enough, the Battle Royale mode for Battlefield 5 was announced at E3 2018 and the game itself though would be set to release in November, but the Battle Royale mode wouldn't be ready for November. I'll be honest, and you'll hear me say this anytime we talk about Battlefield games, I've always struggled to just get into Battlefield as a whole. I think it's just the bigger settings makes it harder for me to feel in multiplayer that like my contract matters, but Luke on the other hand, he loves Battlefield games. So he tried this all out when Battlefield 5 first launched and stuck around through the Battle Royale release as well. And honestly, when they announced the Battlefield 5 Battle Royale mode at E3 2018, I was pretty excited for it. I always loved Battlefield's gunplay, and I thought a BR centered around their gunplay could work well. And during the announcement, they did say that the Battle Royale mode would not launch with the game, but shortly after, which to me and I think many others made it seem like it would be coming in a couple weeks after launch. But a month before the release of Battlefield 5, EA posted this roadmap that showed that the BR mode wasn't coming until March of next year. That would be five months after after the launch. And at that point, Battlefield 5 already had some negative news around it and the late launch of the BR mode didn't help. It honestly just seemed weird that they announced the Battle Royale mode that early and they didn't have it ready for another five months after launch. Now, the release of Battlefield 5 also wasn't that smooth. It just felt like there was a lot of things missing and the map variety wasn't as great as some other Battlefields before. And I think that just kind of made it hard for players to stick around and keep playing this game if the content just isn't there. And then what do you got to look forward to? The BR mode? Five months down the road that's a long time they did keep updating the base game slowly and the br would finally launch in march of 2019 and honestly the BR mode, it was subpar. The best part about the BR mode was the map and the destruction that you could cause on the map. But the other mechanics like the looting system, which was really slow and really tedious, the slow pace of the game, I would play games and sometimes not see anyone for like minutes and the game's only being like 20 minutes long. If you don't see anyone for six, seven minutes, it's just boring. And also remember the progression system being basically non-existent compared to other BRs. It just seemed like a mess. And on top of that, the integration of Battlefield 5 was just kind of a double-edged sword. There was a seamless experience for players that already owned Battlefield 5, they could just hop into the Battle Royale mode, but for new players, they had to just straight up buy Battlefield 5. And there's a reason most Battle Royale games are free. And I think that reason just comes down to it is easier to fill up these big lobbies if your game is free to play and you can keep a bigger player base because of it. And Battlefield 5, Firestorm, did not have any of that. The wait times have always been long. I mean, you can still find games nowadays, but you'll be waiting for a while. And while I don't think Battlefield 5's Firestorm was awful, I just think it didn't deliver enough to make it stand out. And I think Battlefield players at the end of the day just want to have a true Battlefield experience. They don't want some extra BR mode or some Tarkov style extraction shooter like the new one has. They just want the base Battlefield experience. And it seems like every time they don't deliver that, players just reject it. Then there are a couple of other games out there in the Battle Royale genre that released and technically then would fall off pretty hard. Nintendo had Pac-Man 99 on Nintendo Switch, which was a really interesting idea. It took the whole concept of Pac-Man and had everyone competing against each other in this epic battle royale. It kind of was like Tetris 99, but this time around it was, you know, Pac-Man. This, oddly enough, would be sunsetted back in October of 2023. And I don't know why these games have to be limited. Maybe it's because Nintendo wants to try out different games in this style and not necessarily have a player base spread across Tetris 99 or Pac-Man. 
Pac-Man 99 or something else 99. Back in 2020, some of you might remember there was Super Mario Bros. 35. This game, similarly to what we were just talking about with Pac-Man 99 or Tetris 99, essentially had 35 players pitted against each other in a game of Super Mario Bros. It was kind of a cool concept to bring something like a platformer into the Battle Royale realm in one way or another, but this game was planned on just being a limited time event and closed six months after its launch in April of 2021. Okay, and now we have Cuisine Royale. Where do we even start with this game? Okay, so this game started off as an April Fool's joke in 2018 based on the engine used for the Enlisted games. However, as the popularity in 2018 was growing for Battle Royale games, full development would go underway with an open beta test happening soon after this decision was made. PUBG was becoming very, very popular, and this game was kind of just like a subtle parody on PUBG. I mean, it's called Cuisine Royale, and there's like food items in the game. Now, at the peak of the Battle Royale genre over the following years, the game would launch on PS4 and on Xbox One in December of 2019, and would climb the ranks in the free-to-play sector of video games. In January of 2020, Cuisine Royale was the third most downloaded free-to-play PlayStation game. Now, at the time, PUBG was kind of a bit of a janky mess and was a PC-centric game with an Xbox version that was apparently going to be a console exclusive. So with that popularity that PUBG was having, for some reason, Cuisine Royale was like the closest true-to-form experience to PUBG, something that looks realistic, that let you have these gun choices and the looting setups in the way that it did, and Call of Duty Warzone wasn't out yet either. But there was more. For whatever reason, they decided halfway through the life of this game, they were going to do a full-on rebrand, and this rebrand hopefully would bring in more players to take this game seriously. So instead of being called Cuisine Royale, they did the big second edition or 2.0 update, which was called the second edition. But now if they change it to the second edition, they could rename their entire game, this time around calling it Cursed FOAD, which apparently stands for Cuisine Royale Second Edition Fulfillment of Desires. That sounds dark, but the gameplay is still pretty much on par for what you would expect from a game like this. It does feel a lot like PUBG at times, but also sometimes it feels like there are a couple of really odd decisions that were made with this game. Now, at the very least, if you are a huge cursed FOAD fan, fortunately enough, it does seem like this game still gets some level of support in player base. It's not fully dead just yet, so there's still hope if you're looking for more varied experience where you don't want to dish out the money to buy a game like Player Unknown's Battlegrounds or Call of Duty. They also added this new skin to the game, which I swear to you, it looks like Howie Mandel. I've reached out to ask them about it and I still don't have my answers. And another game that was a pretty big mess was The Culling 2. The original Culling was actually one of the earliest Battle Royale games that I can remember, and it had this crafting system that just added a little bit more depth that wasn't there yet in the BR games at that time. And also like the whole game show-like atmosphere and the dark humor and stuff was kind of funny. It just made the game stand out. And when The Culling 2 was announced on July 8th of 2018, and it would release just a day later on July 10th, 2018. Now, there wasn't any any hype for this. There wasn't like a big The Culling 2 is coming crowd. People barely noticed that this even released. And they did take a lot of the original concepts like the crafting and the focus on melee combat out of the second game, which immediately isolated anyone that had played The Culling 1 and kind of liked that game. Because the second game just took out all the unique stuff that the first one had. And nobody gave a damn about The Culling 2. It was so bad, the play count was so low that the game was pulled from sales and the servers were shut down within a week of its release. That's crazy. And the development studio quickly announced that they would be reverting focus back to the original Culling, and they would re-release the Culling 1 as a free-to-play game, in an attempt to make up for the Culling 2 blunder and maybe win some players back. But I don't think that worked, because they got really desperate in 2020, when they released the Culling Origins, which was supposed to be a relaunch of the original Culling, and it had one of the most unusual monetization approaches I've ever seen. Basically, you had one free match a day, and you had to purchase purchase tokens in order to play more games. So you literally had to pay for every time you would drop in. There was a pass you could buy for unlimited play, but the whole system was just so egregious and was just another big mistake by the developer. It just seemed like they would make worse and worse mistakes every time they changed something. I do think eventually they did go to a proper free to play model, but it was too late and the game is gone by now. The servers are shut down. I don't think you can buy the game anymore. It's delisted from all the storefronts. So the color 
thing is just this weird blemish on the Battle Royale history that is forgotten now, and it's probably for the best. Now, besides some of the big, massive games that released right at the booming point for the Battle Royale genre, there were some other games that were backed by pretty big studios that quickly tried to pivot their games into becoming a Battle Royale game just based on Fortnite alone, having huge success pivoting their save the world survival type game into that giant BR that was hugely successful. Like for instance, Realm Royale is a very interesting case study here. Now the publisher High Res Studios had been working alongside their developer Evil Mojo Games to create the game Paladins, which had been in development for quite a long time and it looked like originally it was supposed to maybe release in 2016, but with the huge popularity and launch of Overwatch, I think they kind of pumped the brakes a little bit to give this game more time to be developed to make sure that when it did release, it would be different enough and stand out enough for players to take interest to it. And the game would finally release in May of 2018. But during the betas leading up to the launch of Paladins, there was already a Paladins Battle Royale game mode baked into the game. It was just called Paladins Battlegrounds. One month after the actual launch of the game, High Res Studios announced that they were branching the game off into two separate games where Paladins would exist on its own and Paladins Battlegrounds would be retitled to Realm Royale and would go with a free to play route. Now I think when Realm Royale came out, there was a little bit of potential here just because the Battle Royale thing was just now getting really popular. And honestly, the gameplay was very similar in some instances to Fortnite, but it was a different game and a different experience altogether. Hey, Realm Royale was cool because when you died, you got to turn into a chicken. And I think that's pretty neat. There were different classes, much like what the main game Paladins kind of had. Actually, this game was hugely successful during the popularity boom of the Battle Royale genre. At one point, it was even the most watched game on Twitch and Mixer. And later in 2018, it hit 4 million players. And by 2019, it had hit 10 million players. So what went wrong here? Well, quite a lot, actually. I think there's a reason that Fortnite is still on top of its game when it comes to Battle Royales. Like, it still has a major player base compared to all of the Battle Royales that came up. And it was because Epic Games was really quick on their feet in realizing that Fortnite was going to become this big, huge thing and made some pretty drastic calls in their development pipeline, moving developers from other smaller projects and bringing them in to work on Fortnite so that Fortnite would have a regular and consistent update release schedule. You'll notice like after a year of Fortnite existing, the updates became more and more frequent and bigger and more content driven than the previous releases. And I think that really helped keep Fortnite relevant way longer. And a lot of these other teams that were working on Battle Royale games didn't have the manpower to regularly cycle through and evolve their game over a shorter period of time. Realm Royale was popular at the beginning because it was an alternative experience to Fortnite, but when Fortnite started creating their own alternative experiences and new seasons released on a regular basis, I think people just latched onto Fortnite with all of the cool things and crossovers that were coming up over there. I think the following years, Realm Royale really struggled with its player base just tanking and essentially they lost any big momentum that they had. In 2020, there was an update called the Deviled Eggs update and then there was no update for two years. You would think Realm Royale would just like shut down after that, but no. Surprisingly enough, high res games still felt like there was something with Realm Royale that was worth keeping around. And just last year, it got a pretty big update called Realm Royale Reforged. This update though, only ever so slightly moved the needle with its player base. And while this game still has maybe a couple hundred players playing at any given time, it doesn't look like it'll ever reach the heights that it once had. Apparently, according to Wikipedia, there are two developers who work under high res studios who are still working on new content for Realm Royale Reforged and occasionally will get assistance from Evil Mojo Games who develop Paladins, but I don't see this one coming back. Is it possible we will still see meaningful updates for Realm Royale Reforged in the future? Probably. Will it be frequent? Probably not. Actually, if anything, I fully expected this game to go down the route of something like Spellbreak, another Battle Royale game that similarly quickly released during that time where Battle Royales were really popular. There was a small developer studio known as Proletariat that was working on a old school combat type game that was focused on magical powers, and they decided to pivot that game into the Battle Royale genre. Once again, this game would be a breath of fresh air against a lot of the other Battle Royale games, and it had okay reviews 
reviews after its release, but the development team was, at the time, just about six people first working on this game. And while this game was a big deal for the studio, getting it off the ground and released all on their own as their own developer and publisher, just two years later, in 2022, Proletariat announced that they would stop working on future updates for Spellbreak as they had been acquired by Activision Blizzard, and the team members would be incorporated in the team that was working on developing World of Warcraft. So this game officially shut down just earlier on this year. Okay, so Activision had Warzone, EA had Apex Legends, Epic Games had Fortnite, and what does Ubisoft have? Well, they needed to have something, right? Well, Ubisoft assigned their studio at Ubisoft Montreal to come up with a Battle Royale game in a first-person type setting called Hyperscape, and this game would try to really double down on like the live streaming side of things and have integration directly with live streamers through Twitch that could affect the outcomes of every match. Now, when this game released, a lot of people were excited to give it a try. The main problem though was the game balancing didn't feel very good. Like sure, the world was cool and you know, the graphics and all of that were interesting, but overall the gunplay and the game mechanics were the biggest and most lacking parts of the game. After its initial pre-release era, Hyperscape fell off really hard. And I think like people just tried it out for a bit, felt like they got cheated in a battle and then would log off and never come back again. I think it didn't help that some of the things that were supposed to be cool features, like the viewer interactivity to affect the game, ended up coming across as more of just an inconsistency in gameplay. So yeah, a lot of people tried this game, a lot of people didn't like it, and the game ended up shutting down in April of 2022. Okay, honestly, I wasn't even sure if I was going to include this next one in the video, but Warface. This game is interesting in itself. It's like a Call of Duty knockoff that kind of is less demanding and graphically impressive as Call of Duty, but it can run on like anything. And it's also free to play, so I think a lot of people jump on and play this game from time to time. And I've played it on and off over the years. It's a little goofy, it's a little weird, but it can be a good time. But here's the thing, with all of the hype of a Battle Royale mode, Warface decided to throw their hat in the ring too, with like a Battle Royale game mode that would come out in 2020. But the Battle Royale mode would be different depending on what system you were on. On PC, for example, it was its own game separate from the main game, but on other systems, it was like a game type within the game. So that's why I was unsure if we should count it. I did play the Battle Royale mode a couple of times, and it was very uh, mid. First of all, there weren't that many people in the game, and it was mostly, I think, big team battle maps that made up the entire Battle Royale map. And from there, you just kind of like run around and fight while the circle closes. And if you end up losing, you just kind of stick around in the lobby and wait for the game to wrap up because the games are that short. I think there was a time period where a lot of people tried this out, realized it was nothing really special, and then never played it again. And I can find messages online of people asking what's going on with the Battle Royale. Is it dead? They can't find a Battle Royale match. And that was like a year and a half ago. I recently went on and tried to find a Battle Royale game and I waited and waited and waited and I could not find a Battle Royale game either. So I think it's safe to say that Warface's attempt at the Battle Royale genre was quickly thrown together and it maybe didn't work that well either. And they kind of just rolled their game back to what they normally are known for, which is their more competitive multiplayer side of things. Grand Theft Auto V actually tried the same thing, but they were fast at getting their stuff out there. Like 2017, right at the hype of everything, of people just discovering PUBG and Fortnite for the first time, Grand Theft Auto announced their new game mode called Motor Wars, which essentially has players in a special section of Los Santos, and they have to jump out of a helicopter, parachute on the ground, and then fight it out and try to be the last person standing. And honestly, I remember this one just kind of feeling unfair. Maybe it's just the multiplayer side of things of GTA Online, where I feel like just whoever clicks on with their auto-aim first wins the fight, and there's not as much strategy or thought that goes into gunfights as in a different game that is based completely around gunfighting only. This game mode maybe helped keep some players who were switching off between GTA and Fortnite to stick around in GTA a little bit longer, but I don't think it necessarily took any players away from Fortnite who were like, oh yeah, I need to go play GTA because that experience is so much better. I actually don't know if they ever did anything with Motor Wars again, but I have a feeling we probably won't see any big updates to this now after all this time. Now, H1Z1, that's a game that I haven't thought about in years, is a game that honestly is interesting because it was kind of one of the first games on the market and definitely benefited from being one of the first Battle Royale games in the traditional sense. Its whole development is really confusing though. So originally there was a game called H1Z1 that entered early access all the way back in January of 2000. 
2015. The game was in a really, really rough spot back then, and soon it was announced that the game would be forking off and splitting development into two separate projects, one which would be called H1Z1 King of the Kill, while the other would be called Just Survive. They even brought on Brendan Green, who is known as Player Unknown, who created essentially the original Arma 3 Battle Royale mod to come on as an advisor for H1Z1. After his stint working on H1Z1 with Daybreak Games, he ended up getting picked up by Blue Hole Games to create Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. And while H1Z1 did thrive a bit when the big boom of the Battle Royale genre was starting to blow up, with PUBG becoming really popular, and H1Z1 did have a bit of some time in the limelight, I think the fact that the game just wasn't polished enough, nor as big in scale as games like PUBG or Fortnite. It just kind of fell to this C-tier quality battle royale game, and I think people were just starting to abandon the game after a couple of years. I played this one a little bit back in the day, and I do remember it being kind of fun. Like, there was some different aspects about it, and eventually they supported up to 150 players, which was pretty cool. But later on, things just really started to fall apart. Some features that were added just didn't make sense, like they added auto royale, and they added a leaderboard that placed players differently and the game left free to play and then went back to free to play. Oddly enough, the game was then handed over to a different development studio for a bit and then handed back over to the original development studio with some things being reverted back to older versions of the game. There's also confusion with the fact that there was another game called H1Z1 Just Survived that had its own development team working on it and then that game would end up getting cancelled. Sometimes the game on PlayStation 4 would get content that PC players wouldn't get. Dude, this game was a hot mess. So then Daybreak ended up getting bought out by Enad Global 7 and this new publisher posted a community update on YouTube saying that the team of developers are looking at H1Z1's code base and they wanted to revert the game back to the golden days whenever that was and then like six months later a different person took over as acting CEO and there's been no updates ever since also the North American servers shut down earlier this year randomly but some European servers are still open and there hasn't been any updates ever since so I don't know what happened this game literally imploded on itself and it just seems like full-on chaos in the whole development process must have been the cause of a lot of this. I don't know what it was about H1Z1, but it always had this scuffed element to it, like with the gameplay itself and just the jankiness of it, and then you'd have someone screaming in your ear with like the lowest quality mic possible. It was just a very unique experience for the time that it released in. I think had this game just like did the normal stuff and didn't like flip hands and go back and forth and had just, you know, a basic outline of what they wanted to do with the game, it probably would still have a decent core player base to this day. Maybe not as big as some of these other games, but maybe like a smaller player base that could still warrant, you know, new updates coming to the game regularly. I mean, outside of Minecraft Hunger Games, this was probably the first time I'd ever actually seen the Battle Royale game type in a fully realized game. So there was something working for this game here. Now also for the sake of this video, because there are so many mobile Battle Royale games, it would take forever to go through every single one that lived and then died. But one that is very interesting that I did want to bring up is Apex Legends Mobile. This is such an interesting case because, you know, we had Fortnite and then they had Fortnite Mobile, PUBG, then they did the PUBG Mobile, and then Apex existed. They eventually got a Switch version of the game, so that was a big plus. And then Apex Mobile came out, and that was a really big deal. What happened to Apex Legends Mobile? Now, Apex Legends Mobile launched in March of 2022 globally. And honestly, there was quite a bit of buzz around Apex Legends Mobile when it was announced. It was actually seeing regular updates, and that was cool and all. Maybe it wasn't the most popular BR on mobile, but it definitely had a player base. But then in January of 2023, just about six-ish months after its release, EA announced plans to shut down the game and that they would be sunsetting content and wrapping things up by the one-year mark of the game, essentially. The reason for the shutdown was pretty ambiguous. EA said that the game fell short of the bar for quality and cadence, and just like that the decision was made to sunset the game. Fortunately, they were able to release like the season that they had been working on during this time, so it did have one good final send-off season, but it was a very surprising twist considering how big Apex Legends seemingly is. 
I mean, Apex Legends Mobile even had their own mobile exclusive legends, Fade and Rhapsody, and neither of these characters ever appeared in the main version on PC and console. Now, if you're not a hardcore PC gamer, you probably never heard of the game Super People, but this game had a lot of hype during its initial closed beta test in February of 2022. 4.3 million players participated in this beta on Steam. Those are huge numbers, and now the question is, how did this game get so much hype? Well, it was kind of like PUBG, but on steroids. The game looked and felt like PUBG, but it was mixed with this class-based system where you had like these superheroes or super people or whatever you want to call them. And each character had unique abilities like one guy got a shield, one guy was a firearms expert, one guy could teleport, another guy could like dash or something. And for the most part, this worked like a normal BR with looting, running around till you find a fight and things like that. But it was the class-based system that obviously set it apart from the other BRs like PUBG or Fortnite. This class-based system was really weirdly designed because instead of just straight up being able to pick your character, you were assigned a random character at the start and then had to re-roll the character or pay a little more to get the character you wanted. During the beta, I don't think this was a real money currency, but it for sure seemed like it was gonna be in the future. I played the beta and I thought it was kind of fun. And when I said this felt like PUBG, this felt like PUBG. And after the successful beta in early 2022, the game did launch into early access in October of 2022. But I do think between the original success of the first beta and the launch into early access there was a couple more betas and i don't think those betas saw as much hype and upon launch into early access not much changed it peaked at 47,000 players and just kept bleeding players constantly eventually like two months after the launch they would rename it to super people 2 which to me just seems like an attempt to recapture the initial hype that the closed beta had but it was also kind of confusing because you played this beta called super people and then super people 2 launches and you're like like, what happened to the first one? And personally, I could never really figure out how the game fell off this hard. Maybe it was the class-based system that was just too weird for a battle royale game like this. Maybe it was the monetization system that was kind of predatory. Maybe it was all that confusion with the Super People 2 rebranding. Maybe it was all these. Maybe it was more. I don't know. All I know is that in May 2023, just a little over six months after the early access launch, it was announced that the game is gonna be shutting down. With the official reason being cited twindling numbers of users, despite balanced patches and efforts to change the game consistently. So the developer just kind of gave up and shut down the game. And that's the end for Super people. I guess they weren't so super after all. Okay, this next one is a game that not a lot of people even know actually existed. I was kind of surprised myself, but Dying Light had a battle royale mode, oddly enough. Weird. I didn't know that. Yeah, it was called Dying Light Bad Blood, and I don't know, this is a weird situation. So in 2018 at E3, they announced Dying Light 2, and then a couple of months later, just all of a sudden this Dying Light battle royale game came out and it was weird it went into early access it was twenty dollars which i don't know that's kind of a weird thing already for where we're going with what we've seen happen with battle royale games but then on top of that for all of these other battle royale games the big emphasis was like there's a hundred players or there's like 60 players or something you know when warzone announced it was a big deal because it was like 150 players this one had six players that's not a lot yeah but they hyped it up as its own battle royale then it silently was removed from like Steam as its own listing because it was originally listed as its own thing. And then it was just given away to players who had Dying Light 1 already for free. So those players could play it and then the game kind of just died off after that. And I just wonder, like, we know that 2018 was a big year. They announced Dying Light 2 and then there was a ton of delays down the road. And I just wonder if some of the resources that could have gone into Dying Light 2 were instead like forked over to the Battle Royale mode instead that didn't do anything and then they had to redirect the team back and maybe that caused delays. You know the size of it almost makes you think this was like a weekend project. Could have been. There was a couple of interesting things that that studio has done like didn't they have a whole like different game they were working on and then they canceled the game and then just released it as Dying Light DLC. Wait, which one was that? It was like some arc. It was like in the game you go into an like you play an arcade and then it's like a whole different game. I, I'm I'm pretty sure we'll show the footage on the screen. Where we're talking about this section, but it's it was a thing. Uh, and they were just open about it. They're like, yeah, we canceled this game, so we we just put it out as DLC in Dying Light One. Enjoy. And I think it was okay. It was like a cool concept. It was different, but they do weird things over there at uh, Techland, I think it is, for sure. Yeah, like make six-player Battle Royale ga games, apparently. And then take it down like a month or two later. But we're talking about BR games with low lobby numbers. Did you know that the Counter-Strike Battle Royale mode only had 18 players? 
which also is not a lot. Wait, really? Yeah. And you know, if you ever play Counter-Strike, it is more slow and more tactical, right? So I think instead of, you know, going for the big fast gameplay pace that a lot of the BRs with 100, 150 players go for, they just went for the slow, methodical gameplay. And I mean, honestly, I think it was kind of good. Whatever ended up happening to it. Well, uh, since Counter-Strike 2 released, it was removed. So there's no way to play it anymore. There's no statement on why it was removed or why it isn't there. And I mean, maybe it didn't have enough players, but I mean, it was fun to hop on every now and then. But honestly, I played like once a year. Was it still popular towards the end, do you think, or? It's honestly hard to tell because like there's so many players on Counter-Strike, right? If there's a million players every day, maybe 20k played that Danger Zone mode every day. Who knows? Right. That is interesting. It's very hard to crash, but... I mean, there is a slight chance they'll come back in Counter-Strike 2, we just don't know yet. What does a Counter-Strike Battle Royale even look like? Well, instead of like a circle closing, there was like these hexagons, and the map was sectioned in these hexagons, and the hexagons would just close or like get bombed, and then you couldn't be in the hexagons anymore. So it wasn't like a closing circle, it was just like parts of the map stopped being available until there was only one hexagon left, and all the players funneled into that hexagon. And on top of that, Actually, the way you looted and stuff was more like you got like ammo and money and then you would order a gun via drone, just like you would buy when you're playing a competitive Counter-Strike match. And you could shoot down players' drones. That was actually an interesting concept. So someone would order an AK, you could just shoot it down, steal his AK. Huh. Okay, so if we're talking about not totally awful Battle Royale games for a quick second, we do have to, for the topic and the sake of this video, send our salutes off to the fallen... Call of Duty Warzone 1. That game was actually really fun. Yeah. And uh, obviously it's dead because you can't play it anymore. I think, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's as dead as it gets. It had a strong player base all the way through the end. Uh, but Call of Duty wants to obviously move people into Warzone 2. And when Warzone 2 released, the writing was kind of on the wall. Warzone got progressively worse over the years too with uh, the newer map, like Cal the Caldera map or whatever. Yeah, I mean, lots of fun memories from, uh, you know, the pandemic days when Warzone 1 dropped and we just played it, we just did so much stuff on there. The original map was the best one and it's just sad that it's gone. Maybe it'll come back in the future. It is interesting though, because they've rebranded Warzone 2 to just Warzone now, right? With the whole Call of Duty headquarters and all that. So they, they don't even consider it Warzone 2, it's just Warzone still. But all of our skins, our weapons we leveled up, all of that, like, I mean, that was over there. Like we don't have them anymore. It's not the same way with like Fortnite OG with the, how they're handling the going back or whatever, or their new seasons in general, you still have all your skins and cosmetics and stuff that you bought, but there was a cutoff. And um, I do think it's a little weird how they kind of like rebranded Warzone 2 back to just Warzone as if it's the same game, but you know, all of your all of your microtransactions you spent money on are gone now. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's actually kind of crazy because they never shut down Call of Duty games, right? Right, you can still go back and play any of them, I think. Right, they just recently fixed a server of some really old ones. And now we're here, can't play Warzone 1 anymore, which just came out like three years ago. Kind of stupid. That is that is kind of wild. Then, I don't know if this one also counts as a dead Battle Royale, or even a, a Battle Royale to begin with. Because we did see over time other games that kind of fall into this like Royale-like mode, but it's not a Battle Royale, like um, Fall Guys, uh, the one with those pigeons I was playing. Uh, Switch Sports, they had uh, bowling in a, like a Battle Royale mode when that came out. And I remember that being kind of fun. Switch Sports was an interesting game. It had like a lot going for it in just like providing that like Wii Sports experience again. But then also, there's just like a lot of like really simple things that kind of make sense that just aren't there. And I don't know, the the, the player base kind of fell off, but uh, honestly, I haven't picked up the Switch in a minute. So I haven't checked out to see how active the player base is, but I still wanted to acknowledge it because it's not like a lot of people are talking about Switch sports in general nowadays, right? It was a thing for a minute at its peak. There's no competitive leagues of Switch sports bowling Royale or whatever. So I assume the player base has dropped off quite a bit and there's no updates coming so uh it was just a little thing that existed for a minute and then just kind of fizzled out into the universe while we're talking about like weird uh battle royale type games there is a forza horizon battle royale mode and i think they introduced it in forza horizon 4 initially it's called like the eliminator and there's like 72 players in a lobby wait really it sounds kind of awesome apparently the way you race in this game was you go head to head with the players and you can earn points with like these head to head races and eventually people get eliminated i don't quite understand how there is a kill feed in this game but there is a closing circle and 
you know, there's 72 players, so this kind of seems chaotic. It allegedly sounds pretty awesome. But technically it hasn't failed because they did reintroduce it into Forza Horizon 5. So it'll have to go into the next video, the sequel to this one. The sequel, the Battle Royale games that are going to die one day. Or that died in between the two videos. One day we'll get around to that. There was another game that we wanted to talk about, but then we're unsure if we should count it. I remember watching the original teaser for it, but it was called like Vampire the Masquerade Blood Hunt. I looked into it a little bit as a potential topic. There's still kind of a player base surrounding this game. It's not a lot, but occasionally they'll have like a thousand people check in and play. So it's not dead yet. It's one of those more niche battle royale games but this one's about vampires. But I mean, we've seen other niche battle royale games survive for a long time. Like Naraka Blade Point is kind of a smaller one that still has a lot of players. And then you can think of like that, that animal, what was that one? That Animal Royale one we played? Uh, Super Animal Royale. We try that one every couple of months and we just always have an awful time and we're always really bad at it. But conceptually it's interesting. Just everyone else is really good at it and we don't, commit to getting better at it. Maybe a game like Hunt Showdown, you know, just that has a player base. It still gets updates kind of, and, and it lives on. It's not quite a dead battle royale yet. Right, I mean, I think that one is decently popular still actually. Well, let's get back to some dead battle royale games, like dead, 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 dead. dead. And one of them is uh, Final Fantasy VII Battle Royale mode, exclusive to iOS and Android. Now, you and me played a little bit of Final Fantasy XIV. Now imagine this world, like, you know, the Crane Hills, like the fantasy world, but you're running around with guns, just blasting players. The circle is closing. You hop on your chocobo and you just, like, roll up on some dude. There's guns in Final Fantasy? Yeah, um, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> I know nothing about Final Fantasy other than the little bit we played of that MMO. I'm so lost when he said there's guns. Are there guns in a lot of Final Fantasy games? Is that a thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, the guns are a part of it. It's just like so jarring. I don't know, just watching it. Because like usually it's not just gunfights, but this game is all gunfights in the Final Fantasy world. So it's a little weird, but I mean, it wasn't that popular and it's gone by now. I think they shut it down within two years of release. So there wasn't a lot of time to play it. It had a good run. It, I mean, it had a run. I don't know if it was good. Uh, so it looks like there was a game called Scavengers that we just completely missed the ball on uh, back in the day where we missed the hype for it. It was a battle royale and... It has mixed reviews on Steam, and it's no longer available to download. So yeah, I guess it's, I guess rest in peace scavengers and that's it. Guess how many players are right now on Steam? How many? One. Wait, one? Yeah, there's one lonely soul waiting for a lobby to fill up. He don't, no, no, dude, he won. Oh, he's the last man standing. He was the last man standing, dude. He won the battle royale. The ultimate chicken dinner. Dude, the ultimate chicken dinner. You know, another game that has one play on Steam right now, Darwin Project. Wow, yay, congratulations. I remember Darwin Project was like one of those battle royale games announced way, way back. Almost, I wanna say it had Origins not even being a battle royale. It was like its own thing and then it kind of pivoted more into the traditional battle royale sense just because the game was out during that time am i right on that yeah i maybe i'm confusing it but i almost remember it being like almost a hero shooter initially or looking like a hero shooter and then they pivoted maybe right and there was like this like element of like being a spectator kind of like what hyperscape tried to do on a larger scale uh and i think you could influence the game or the map or something like that interesting i think those were the main topics well actually there's one more I just thought of. Okay, which one is that? Do you know the Worms franchise? Um, is that like a turn-based game or something? Right, exactly. All the games are turn-based strategy games. You like, you have one shot, you know, you do your turn, then someone else does their turn. And that's how the whole game works. Now, they released a BR mode called Worms Rumble, or BR standalone game, I should say. And instead of it being turn-based, you just run around the map, just gunslinging. So like it immediately changed the core gameplay of Worms and immediately died. Did it really just die right away? I think so, yeah. I, I don't think this game ever gained any popularity. I remember reading somewhere about Worms being like, uh, it was like its own game, but then they advertised so heavily that it was going to have this battle royale aspect to it. And it was just weird that they like leaned into it so much with the marketing that it maybe it would have been better on its own if they didn't do the whole battle royale shtick. There was 800 players, uh, at launch that was the peak 800 that's the peak and now there's zero so there isn't even the last man standing that's like so small for a 
game that has like the reputation that Worms has? Well, you know, we've seen it with many BRs in this video. It wasn't free to play. They tried to sell for $15. And this just never works out for these Battle Royale games. If they're not free to play, they just don't ever take off. Did we forget to bring up Rumbleverse in this video also? That wrestling Battle Royale game that we played back in the day when it was released. It was like a free to play. I don't even know what to call it. Superhero wrestling game. I remember it not being fun. It was a miserable experience. I mean, we, we did recently talk about it in one of our videos. We played it. We played a couple rounds we played like one one night of it i would say and it was awful I, I didn't have that much fun with it maybe some other people like got it better than we did but we were just lost i don't know we we won we i think we won a game and we still were like what is this how did we win uh i don't know i think like we just brawled until someone died outside the circle i think i remember pushing some people outside the circle at the end okay Big question, and we could wrap this up. Okay, 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 hit me. What's the next Battle Royale game to die? Oh, what's your answer? We played it. Is it the My Hero Academia one? I think it's going to be the My Hero Academia one. That's a good pick. It's really cool in what they did with it and trying to like bring the anime world to life. And I think it could have worked, but I think the entry level for new players to get into the game is way too high like you have to understand fighting games i think i don't know like you pick up fortnite anyone can like learn fortnite relatively quickly even call of duty like you just you just go and this one just felt way too advanced and then on top of that the people you're up against are really really good at the game maybe like the people who really do play the game and grind it out and then the queue time to get back into another game felt very long where it's like okay we died now we have to wait forever to drop again and that that i think does contribute to battle royale games dying off pretty quickly when you just have to sit around on a long queue time it's just frustrating you know you drop in you get a limit right away and your penalty is waiting 10 minutes for the next game to start it's just not a good loop it's it's not fun like the early days of PUBG where you could just drop pochinki maybe get a kill practice some practice some kills maybe and then if you die you just drop again no big deal tilted towers same thing i miss dropping pochinki all right well uh, thanks everyone who stuck around this far to the video. We appreciate you guys watching and listening. We upload new videos like this every week, so make sure you guys come back to see what we're talking about next time. Uh, huge shout out to our patrons for supporting this channel, helping us make content like this. Uh, if you want to support us, you can check out our Patreon link in the description down below and get your name in the credits of our video. And also, uh, shout out to our sponsor, Bespoke Post, for hooking us up with the sponsorship for this video you guys if you liked the stuff we talked about earlier in the video check out their link down below otherwise we'll see you guys next time with a new video bye bye, bye.